Let me start off by introducing myself. If we have not met, my name is Adam, and what a privilege it is to have you here this morning. If you were new, if you do me a favor, go over right over here to the next steps. We want to tell you all about the church, get some stuff into your hand, and just get to know you. We are currently in a series we've been calling The King is Here. This is week three of The King is Here. How many love the Christmas season? Anyone just love the Christmas season? You know, the thing I love about it most is this, is that people all around the world are singing about our God and our King and don't even realize and don't even know it. You go into the mall, they're singing about Jesus. They don't even realize or know it. But there is this realization that when Jesus came 2,000 years ago and he was born in a humble way in a manger, there is only one response to him, and that is worship. And that's what we're talking about this morning. I also just want to say to you this morning, man, if the Christmas season is a hard one, maybe you've lost someone this year that you love deeply, maybe you're going through just a difficult time, a moment, uh, my heart goes out to you. And we just want to say, man, we love you, and we're praying for you. And uh, I want to encourage you to come forward for prayer at the end uh, today. But we're going to be in Matthew chapter 2. If you have your Bibles out, go ahead and turn there. Matthew chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 1 this morning. It says this. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews. For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Verse 6. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Look at this next part. When they had heard the king that they had departed, behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Verse 11, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. If you like my notes, you can text notes to the number on the screen. What's in front of me this morning will be in front of you. I've entitled my message this morning, The Only Response. The Only Response. The Only Response. You know, there's a couple things in life that uh, when you're asked a question, there's only one appropriate response. When it comes to a true or false question, there's only one response. Either it's true or it's false. When it comes to math, two plus two is always going to be what? It's always going to be four. There's only one response. If you live in, in Jacksonville and you're asked what's your favorite NFL team, the only appropriate response is what the Jaguars, yes and amen. If you're asked if FSU got robbed this past week, what's the only appropriate response? Yes, they got robbed. There's only one appropriate response to when you become and you re become to the realization, understanding that Jesus was born 2,000 years ago in a manger and he died on the cross, a gruesome death, and rose again on the third day. There is only one appropriate response. And what is that response? Worship. It is worship. It is worship before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
There's only one appropriate response when it comes to Jesus, and that is worship. Herod, he knew this. He knew that there was only one response to a king, which was worship, which was why he said this. He said, let me know where he is so that I might go worship him too. But in fact, what was his meaning? It was to go and kill Jesus. I'm afraid far too often we're much more like Herod where we are trying to, because what do you want to do? He wanted to take worship for himself. He didn't want anybody else to worship Jesus. He was king and he wanted to be worshiped. And far too often we look more like Herod than we do like the Magi, the wise men who came and offering his extravagant gifts. I'm guilty myself. We're all guilty of this at times. Going to Africa and seeing just, man, how blessed we really are. We are worshipers of self and worshipers of money so far too often. We're going after pleasure. We're going after comforts. We're going after everything else oftentimes. And I am guilty myself. And the only appropriate response when it comes to Jesus, King Jesus, is worship. It is worship. It is to go down on our knees and to tell the Lord, man, God, you are so good, you are so wonderful, I worship you. There's only one appropriate response to Jesus, and that is worship. Let me ask you this question today. Do you worship King Jesus with purity of heart? Do you worship King Jesus from purity of heart? Jesus said to the woman at the well, a time is coming and now has come that they will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. When we worship, may we worship from purity of heart. It was said about David this, that David was a man after God's own heart. May God say about the people of Journey that the Journey Church is a people who are after my heart. Do you want to be a person after the heart of God? May we be people who worship him in spirit and in truth, where we're not just going through the motions and we're not just worshiping just to worship, but what we are saying and what we are doing is coming from a heart response within because we love the Lord so much. Why do we love him so much? Because, I mean, because we spent time with him. I, I said this uh, last week when I was, when I was uh, uh, preaching in, in Africa, and I said, you know, and you've heard this before from me, that there's something about hunger, spiritual hunger, Natural hunger, when you eat, you become full. But spiritual hunger is what? It is when you spend time with the Lord, you just want more of him. It's coming to a place of, man, I just want more of God. I have to have him. I have to be around him. I have to have this friendship and this relationship with him. There's this desire within where you're so hungry for the Lord and you have to have him and you have to be around him. You have to have this relationship with him. But it's coming from this pure place, not this empty place of just offering up empty phrases and words to the Lord. It says this in Matthew chapter 15. It says, hypocrites, God help us when we become that way. I know myself, there's some things in my life, sometimes I've become a hypocrite. Hypocrites, Lord, help us not to be this. Hypocrites, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, so this was Jesus saying this is fulfillment of prophecy from the book of Isaiah. He says this, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me. I don't know about you, but man, I don't want to worship God in vain. I don't want to just offer lip service to God. I don't want to just go through the motions, but I want my heart and my life to be fully wrapped into the Lord and what he has for me and what he wants for me. I want my worship to be pure and authentic like David's worship was. Would you repeat after me and say this? God give me a pure heart. Come on, say it again. God give me a pure heart. 
Lord, would you give us a pure heart this morning, a heart of worship for you, Father? That is our cry. That is what we desire. That is what we want. So this is what I want to do this morning. I want us to come to an understanding of what worship and what praise is. In the Bible, there are seven different Hebrew words for praise throughout the Old Testament. You might be saying, Adam, I don't care about Hebrew words. What's important this morning is this. It's not the Hebrew words themselves. What's important is the concept of each every word that we mention here this morning. Because if our goal is to worship God in spirit and in truth, and to worship from a pure heart of worship unto God, and not to just go through lip service and go through the motions, we need to understand what worship is. Anybody with me this morning? We need to understand why we worship and why we do the things that we do and what, is, what the Bible says about it and what is biblical. So uh, if you texting notes to the notes that's under the screen, I didn't go through that point, but you can text notes to the notes, the, you text notes to the number that's on the screen right now, and you can get the, actually all the references for these different Hebrew words there. So I encourage you to do that and follow along with us this morning. Let's read Psalm 145, verse 1. It says this, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise. So that word praise there is a Hebrew word. It's yada. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. It's another Hebrew word. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. So let's look at these Hebrew words for praise. Again, seven different meanings for each word for praise written throughout the Bible. And what's important is the concept of these. So let's go to the first one this morning. The first one is yada. Yada occurs 114 times in the Old Testament. Its meaning is this, to lift up hands, confess, or declare the attributes of God is an attitude of love towards God. Psalm 145, 2 says this, and I will praise, that word praise there is yada, I will yada your name forever and ever. Now the first time that we see this word used in scriptures in Genesis, in Jacob and Leah, they lift their hands to God and begin to thank the Lord for their son who is named Judah. Judah means praise. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that beautiful? So the first time we see this word yada in scripture is when they begin to lift their hands and begin to thank him for this beautiful, amazing baby boy. I don't know about you, but man, when my kids came along, I, I felt the same way. I was so thankful that they finally came, and I know my wife was even more thankful because she had in the belly for nine months. Amen. Do you remember the first time you ever lifted your hands to the Lord and just began to worship him? And to begin to thank him, something broke in that moment, and praise was birthed inside of you. It was a powerful moment that we would yada God, that we would lift up our hands, that we would thank him for his goodness and his love and his mercy in our life. So yada means to lift up hands, to thank him for his goodness, his greatness. It's a thankful expression of worship. The second Hebrew word I want to give you this morning is this word halal. Say halal. Halal occurs 165 times in Scripture. It means this, to shine, to boast, to show, to rave, to celebrate, to be clamorously foolish. It's an act madly word. It's a dance before the Lord like David danced when he was dancing before God undignified. Psalm 145.2 says this, Every day I will bless you. I will praise, that word praise there is actually yada, your name for an herb, we read that uh, a second ago. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. That word is halal and his greatness is unsearchable. So in other words, great is the Lord and greatly to dance before him, to go crazy about Jesus and his greatness is unsearchable. Man, I'll tell you what, going to Africa, the people in Africa, man, is part of their culture. They get this dance before the Lord. I actually have a video of them dancing. <laughs> I mean, look at them go. They got more rhythm than I got, that's for sure. 
I got two left feet. You might be saying, Adam, I'm the same way. I got two left feet too. I can't dance before God. But I'm telling you, when you begin to dance before God, something happens. It brings a joy into your life. And this is what I think about why, the, by the, why this is part of their cultures because, man, they have so little because they're so oppressed by their government that, you know, going there, there's really only two ways uh, that people kind of walk through life. Either they have the joy of the Lord or they're super just oppressed and down. But what dance, dancing before God did, does, and why they have that so, such an integral part of their culture is because it releases joy into the atmosphere when you dance before God. When you begin to dance before the Lord, it releases joy. And so as they dance before God, I tell you what, man, I just felt the joy of the Lord. And I had this smile on my face, man. I'm like, man, these people, they are going after God with everything they have, everything they are. They don't care what they look like. Well, actually, they, they, uh, they just they have way more rhythm. So, you know, for me, I'm a little more self-conscious about it. I'm, I kind of look really foolish. I can't dance, guys, at all. I can slow dance with my wife a little bit. But they had this joy with the Lord. They had this joy as they danced before God. I want to give you a little word of warning this morning. It's so easy sometimes to look at other people's worship and begin to criticize them. To look at them and say, man, why are they dancing like that? Why are they going after the Lord like that? Why are they lifting their hands? I don't understand any of that. Man, it is biblical. It's in the word of God. And you can look at them and you can judge their worship. Michael, Saul's daughter, David's wife. As David danced before the Lord, she looked at him and she judged him. And as she judged him, it says in Scripture that she despised him. She despised him. There's this pride issue in her whole life. Because she was thinking, why is a king dancing like that before God? Well, it's because the ark was coming in, the presence of the Lord, and David was so excited and happy about what was happening in that moment. But it says this in the, in the word of God, that she was from that point forward barren, which was one of the worst things that can happen to a woman in that culture and in that time. She couldn't conceive a child. Herod. Herod tried to destroy the worship of the magi, of the wise men, he was trying to kill baby Jesus to stop people from worshiping him because he himself wanted to be worshipped. What ended up happening to Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus? They had to escape and go to Egypt. And it says, after some time, it was spoken to Joseph that you can go back to Israel, take the child and Mary back with you because Herod had now died. Here's the thing. It says child. It was just a short period of time after he tried to kill Jesus that he passed away. Here's a word of warning. If you try to stop the worship in other people's life, if you try to judge other people for their worship and say they're not being real, whatever's going on in your own heart, you better watch it. It is a dangerous place to be, and I'm telling you this morning, don't ever judge someone else's worship. Don't ever judge somebody else's worship. May we worship him in spirit and in truth. The next Hebrew word for praise is this. It's Shabbat. Shabbat occurs 11 times in Scripture. Shabbat means this. It means to shout praises to God. Psalm 145.4 says this, one generation shall praise or shabak your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. So the word praise in this verse is shabak. Its literal meaning is one generation is going to shout the mighty acts of God into the next generation. Psalm 63.3 says this, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips Shall shout praises, shall praise you. Think about that. Think about what the Lord has done in your life. 
This is a release word of the Spirit. It's a response for what God has done in your own life. And sometimes when people shout, you're like, man, why are they shouting right now? Why, why are they doing that? This is so weird. But what's happening really in the Spirit is they're releasing something because God is so good and he's so wonderful. And so the only appropriate response sometimes is to release the shout of praise into the atmosphere. And listen, this shout, it changes the atmosphere of everyone that hears it except for the person who wants to judge someone else's heart. What ends up happening to the person who wants to judge is a hard heart before God. It hardens their heart even more, like Michael's heart. But man, when you release a shout of praise, it attacks the atmosphere and it changes everything. That shout of praise that happened when the walls of Jericho came down, that's the ruah of God It's the Holy Spirit. The Ruah of God is the Holy Spirit. And when you shout praises to the Lord from a heart that is pure before him, it changes everything. It breaks down walls. It breaks depression. It brings joy. And so as you begin to shout, it's a release word that changes the atmosphere. Can someone just shout praises to God for he is good. Lord, you're so good and you're so wonderful. Shabak, Shabak, it's a release word. Worship is a spirit response, and these words are a reaction to the spirit of God. We shout because he's good. We shout because he's worthy. We shout because he is overcome. We shout because through him we have victory, amen? Amen. The next Hebrew word for praise is this, zamar. Zamar. Zamar occurs 41 times in Scripture. It means this, to play an instrument or to sing. To play an instrument or to sing. Psalm 7, 17 says this, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises that were praised there, zamar. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. Psalm 98, 4, shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice in sing praises that were praised is the mar. Here's the thing about instruments and the thing about worship as we sing together. What songs and instruments do is they multiply the authority. What I mean is that, I don't know if you understand this, but as we worship him, there are certain different types of songs. We begin to sing songs of spiritual warfare. It's bringing us as a congregation together to sing the same thing at the same time, and in that, it is extremely powerful. Through the cadence, and through the rhythm, and through the melody, it comes and it breaks forth in psalm because we're joining together and it's prayer. Some people like to separate worship and praying, but they're really two of the same thing. That's why Wednesday nights, I believe, are so vitally important. What we are doing on Wednesday nights is we come here for our Wednesday night prayer service is we have worship happening, but it's worship and prayer, and we're standing in the gap, and we're interceding for our church, for our city, and for our nation, and it is powerful when we come together. I encourage you, come on on Wednesday nights sometime. Let's be people of prayer. I tell people too on Wednesday nights, it's not for us. We're not coming together to pray for us. We're not trying to receive anything. We're coming to do spiritual warfare. And what instruments and songs do is they allow us to sing the same thing at the same time and to bring all of us together in unity, unity of spirit, and it's powerful. Think about this. There are physical sound waves right now in this room from my voice. When an instrument plays, when a drummer plays, when a guitar plays, when a piano plays, when you begin to sing, there are vibrations that are released in the atmosphere. And those vibrations can either be good or they can be bad. And when it comes from a pure heart, I mean, it pierces the hearts of men, and it breaks down the calloused heart. And it brings you closer to the Lord because that literally physical sound waves are being released. You get that? You see that? That's why it's so important what you listen to. If you're listening to junk, if you're listening to things that are unholy and not of God, you're going to feel a certain way. 
You are. Watch what you allow yourself to hear. If you're wondering why maybe well, why you're feeling depressed or down right now, what are you listening to? What type of music are you listening to? Maybe you need to go home today. You need to throw some, some delete some stuff off your phone. I'm about to say throw some CDs away. That's, <laughs> CDs aren't no more. Maybe you go to your phone or whatever else, your Spotify playlist, and start deleting some songs off that Spotify playlist, yeah? You got to watch what you're putting in your hearing, and you're putting in your spirit and your soul. You know, you can, you can respond in worship in circumstances in your lives in so many different ways. Many of you guys have heard the story of my mom passing away when I was five years old. She passed away tragically, and uh, my family found out about it six months before she, had, she, she passed away, and so it, it happened really, really fast. And uh, my dad, obviously, and our whole entire family was just was heartbroken, and we, um, we went through a, a, a big-time season of grieving, obviously. And, but what my dad did in that season is he brought myself and my sister together, and we would just worship him. I mean, I'm serious. Like he would get alone, he would get in the living room. He start playing his guitar. He start singing, and we encountered the Lord. And what I believe is, we encountered the Lord, and we begin to sing as the Lord. Like He worked on our heart and healed our heart. What I'm saying to you this morning is, if you are grieving, if you're going through something, if there's something happening in your life, man, the only appropriate response is worship to God. Even if you don't feel like it, worship Him. Allow the Holy Spirit to heal your heart. Amen? The next Hebrew word is this word, todah. Todah recurs 32 times in Scripture. It means this is confession of praise and thanksgiving. This is a sacrificial thanksgiving. It's a praise of surrender. Psalm 42.4 says this, When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with a multitude. I went with them to the house of God. With a voice of joy and praise. A voice of joy and surrender. Psalm 50, 23, whoever offers praise, the word todah there, glorifies me. And to him who orders his conduct aright will show the salvation of God. You know, this is the most common type of praise. This is the most common type of worship. It's when you lift your hands and just say, Lord, the universal sign of surrender. Lord, I just surrender to you. Lord, I want your will in my life. Lord, I want your way. Lord, you, Lord, would you lead me and direct me? It's that surrender type of worship to him. The next Hebrew word I want to give you this morning is this, tehillah. Tehillah. Not tequila, people. <laughs> tehillah. Psalm 51.15 says this, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall, shall show forth your praise shall show forth this tequila, this spontaneous song of the Spirit. Let me show you some example, an example of this. In, in Psalm 22, 1 through 3. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? You can hear David's cry, his loneliness in this. And from my words and my groaning, oh my God, I cry in the daytime. But you do not hear. In the night season, and I am not silent. Verse 3. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. You are enthroned in the praises. You are enthroned in the spontaneous song. One translation, which many of you are probably familiar with, it says this, that he inhabits the praises of his people. And so when you hear that and you think, okay, he inhabits the praises of his people, that word praise there is that word tehillah, which is a spontaneous song. So he makes the promise to only inhabit one type of praise, one type of worship, and that is a spontaneous song of your heart. He responds to all different types, but he only inhabits one. That is that new song of the Lord. The new song of God. It's when you walk around your house and you just start singing songs from your heart to God. It might be a familiar melody, but it's just kind of coming to you. And you begin to worship, you begin to praise Him, you begin to just tell Him how good He is and how wonderful He is with a spontaneous song of the Spirit. Here's the thing about 
about this, Isaiah 61, 3, put on the garment of what? Many of you are familiar with this. Garment of praise. That word praise is the word tehillah for the spirit of heaviness. When you're feeling heavy, when you're feeling downcast, when you're feeling, man, like you want to give up, begin to worship God and begin to sing the spontaneous song from your heart and from your spirit. The reason why I believe that God inhabits this type of worship, but he responds to all the different types of worship, is because it's coming from a real raw, genuine place. You can't make this stuff up. You can't make it up. It's just coming from your heart and from your, from your spirit. He's beginning to sing songs to him. But I, I'll walk around often. I'm just singing to the Lord. It, and it just creates this joy in your life. I want to encourage you, man, if you're feeling heavy, if you're feeling down, just sing to the Lord. It'll change everything around you. Trust me. People might think you're a little crazy for singing yourself, but you know what? It don't matter. Just sing to the Lord. Lift up a song to God, the spontaneous song. That is why often, you know, I'll say, hey, don't worry about words on the screen right now. Just lift up and tell him how good he is, how wonderful he is in your own words. Because I understand and I know that as you begin to do that spontaneously, he inhabits that type of praise. And I want an inhabitation of the presence of God in this place. I don't want just a one-time visitation. I want an inhabitation of the Spirit of God here at Journey. Anyone else want an inhabitation of God? And so we come every single Sunday with an expectancy knowing that the Lord is here, knowing that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is in this place because this is a place that he inhabits. This is a place of habitation because we understand these words. Number seven, the seventh Hebrew word for praise is this, Barak. Barak, it occurs 330 times in Scripture. It means to kneel or bow. It means to bless God. To kneel or bow to bless God. First Chronicles 29.20. 20. Then David said to the whole assembly, praise, that word praise, Barak, to kneel, to bow. Kneel or bow before the Lord your God. So they all praised, they all barocked the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed down, prostrating themselves before the Lord and the king. The response you have to have in the presence of a king is on your face, kneeling down in reverence and in awe before him. That is the one response. It's barock before the Lord. It's this kneeling bow down, it's reverence and awe. You know, I know that we are in a democracy, so we don't really understand um, kings, right, here in the United States. There's a protocol, though, if you're going to meet with a king. The protocol is this, is you prepare yourself by bringing a gift to the king, And so you're preparing yourself, you're preparing a gift for the king to come and to bring this earthly king. And as you come into his throne room, you've got to keep your eyes fixated on the king. And so as you're coming in with this gift, you keep your eyes on the king, but if you keep your eyes, you turn to the right or to the left, the protocol for an earthly king is you're dismissed from the throne room. And then once you get down, you bring this gift and you keep your eyes on him. Once you get down before the king, you kneel And you bow in reverence, and you're thanking him for all that his kingdom and the gifts that he has bestowed upon you as you bring this gift before this king. And so if we do this for a natural king, how much more should we do it for the king of kings and the Lord of lords? Listen, church, the king is here, and the only appropriate response to a king is to worship, is to bow down. Here's the thing, we've got, as we come in here on Sunday mornings, we've got to begin to prepare our hearts ahead of time. Yeah? You wouldn't just come in here with everything else going on, but you would come in here already having your heart to prepare to meet with the king. And so we prepare as a church to meet, knowing that we're meeting with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And as we come into this room, as we come into this place, we fix our eyes on him. We're not turning to the right or to the left. We're not allowing distractions in our life. We'll keep our eyes fixated on him. And then we give him our worship, which is our gift, our lives, that we would lay down our lives as a living sacrifice before our God and our King. 
I want to close with this. Matthew 2, 11, which we read earlier. And when they, they being the wise men, the magi, when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped. That word worship there in the Greek is this word proskunio. Proskunio means to come towards, to kneel and to bow, to kiss the hand of a master. They kneel down before their master, the King of Kings, this baby Jesus. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, this baby boy, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Here's my question this morning. Is what are the Holy Spirit speaking to you about today? Have you judged people unfairly? Have you looked at others and judged their worship? Do you worship him in spirit and in truth? I think that oftentimes I'm guilty. I just kind of go through the motions. The result of why I kind of go through the motions oftentimes because I haven't really stewarded my time with him like I should. Maybe you're in the same spot this morning. Listen, my prayer for you this morning is that during this Christmas season is that you and your families, you would worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in spirit and in truth. And it's a cliche thing to say, but you would understand the reason for the season, which is Jesus. We would get so wrapped around everything else going on, everything else around us. We get so busy during the season, but we would take time to really, truly worship our God and our King. Would you do me a favor this morning? Would you rise with me?